spend most of my time today talking to y'all about is uh, Priority Finance, which is uh, the business I started as an entrepreneur. Um, a little bit about my background in, in as it relates to taxes and government and public policy and thinking a lot about these issues. Um, I got my degree from Duke University, North Carolina. While I was out there in North Carolina, I also took classes at their business school in accounting and marketing. Um, my, my introduction to taxes was through Jumping Jack Tax, which is, I don't know if y'all know much about Jumping Jack Tax. Um, Prince Donnell and Dana Chanel are kind of these um, very young black couple that's, that's kind of taking the social media world by storm of talking about a variety of things, but they, they, they've created this kind of tax um, company where they help um, young uh, especially young people of color start their own tax businesses. So at the end, especially if there are people who have a notary business and you'd like to have a discussion with me about how you can add taxes to your practice, um, I'd be more than happy to do so. Um, also got connected with Dave Ramsey as a financial coach to kind of help people um, navigate a wide variety of things with their finances. Um, and then I uh, spend a majority of my time with Priority Finance now. And so um, if you have any questions about Jumping Jack Tax, Dave Ramsey, or any of the other things, um, I'd be more than happy to answer that. Um, but I wanted to start, Aline, my introduction about what priority finance actually is. It's talking about why we do what we actually do. And in what I found and in what I'm sure, you know, you all as having your notary practices found is that obviously customers and clients want people who will get the job done. They want to make sure that you have the expertise and they want to make sure that you have the skills in order to deliver for them. Uh, but, but another big value, especially, um, I, think, I think now um, in, in the current generation is that um, People care a lot about the values of the people that they patronize. People care a lot about the values of the business and that can help you get a lot of business that you wouldn't get off of your skills alone. Um, and so I'm gonna share a little bit about what Priority Finance believes and what I believe and what my family believes um, as a way just so you know me and you know where I'm coming from, um, but also as a means um, to, to, to kind of show you that you know this can be a platform that you can use for your business, um, that the, your values are not something to shy away from. Um, and so this is our mission statement is that our mission is to help our clients steward their finances in ways that embody their faith, serve their family, and provide them for the future. So those three F's of faith, family, and future are at the pillar of my life personally and then I, what I've kind of poured into the business. So anytime I have a conversation with somebody about their business, about taxes, about you know, wanting to get into real estate, about any of those things, it needs to come back to these three things. Is it embodying your faith and your values? Is it serving your family in the present? And is it setting yourself, your family, or even future generations up for the future? Um, and so this is, this, this is kind of the cornerstone of priority finance and what we believe. Um, and so now kind of transitioning from the why to the how we do what we do. Um, in every single way, we try to educate and empower our clients, right? So if, if by the end of this, you're like, hey, Ray, I have this tax question that I need. Um, I want to sit down for you, sat down with you and ask you some questions. There will never be a time where I necessarily, and then it's not to knock businesses to do this, but it's in our model that I don't pay people to ask me questions, right? If you need me to, 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 to deliver a service for you, then I have no problem doing so. But just because it's at the center of my mission, we love to educate and empower as many people as we can. So, Ray? So, yes, ma'am. I love your passion. But you know, some of us are older than others. I need you to just slow down just yes, a little bit. Take a yes, breath every once in a while. Yes, so yes, old folks catch up. But I love that faith family future. Yes, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use that. Yeah, no, please don't. <laughs> she gonna bite it. <laughs> yeah. Please do. No, please do. Please do. And I appreciate I appreciate you letting me know. I can definitely slow down. And I'll let y'all know when there are things that I really, really want you to soak in and take notes and I'll spend time with. This is just, I'm still just kind of introducing me. And us. Well, yeah, I know, but you still, I want to hear it. So You want to hear it. Oh, so just take a breath every once in a while. Oh. Yes, yes okay. ma'am. Um, and so, so in everything that we do, we want to educate and empower um, the folks that we come in contact with. Uh, we want to be diligent, efficient, and consistent. Those are the three things that I talk about, um, you know, as it relates to the internal operation of our business. And, uh, and the last thing, you know, especially when it comes to taxes, um, people try to play around. People try to play games. People try to finesse the IRS in ways that may or may not follow the law. Um, I do not specialize in creative tax filing or creative accounting. So if you, you know, some people don't get mixed impressions on, on um, what folks who do taxes are able to do for you. Um, I always like to go by the book. I mean, I always like to, to uphold the highest levels of ethics and integrity in what we're doing. Um, so quick summary of what we do. First thing is taxes, right? If you are an individual and you have a family or you're by yourself, that's one thing. If you own a small business and it is, it is taxed as a sole proprietorship or it's taxed as a, um, as a partnership or um, if you have an LLC, 
um, we can we can prepare and file taxes for you or l give you some some things to be thinking about as you prepare for tax season, regardless of how you choose um, to file for yourself. Um, the second part is 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 after we file your taxes, right? Taxes happens most often, you know, the, the tax day is often in April of the following year, right? So, so you wouldn't necessarily plan to, to win the game that you're playing, right? If you're a sports player, you wouldn't plan to win the game, you know, mid-April and then wait until once the game is over to see whether you've won or not. So, so the strategy in advising are some conversations I have with people so that you're not surprised or, or phased by whatever you see next time you file that you can kind of determine what your tax bill is going to be if you do it correctly. Um, and then, and then third is, is, is kind of a new, new wing that we've started um, that we, that's kind of been born out of preparing people's taxes is that a lot of folks who do small businesses need to have these things like bookkeeping, invoices, payroll, and more set up in order to take advantage of anything in the tax code. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that, but we help folks with that. Um, the financial coaching we also do and the notary is coming through. And thanks to Ms. Head and her team. Um, I've been trained, you know, it's been a few weeks now and I've still got to get some things in order to officially launch um, off the notary thing, but I'm, I'm hoping to offer that um, as well. So take, take a trip with me, take a trip with me. However long, this, however long ago this was uh, for you, I want you to think back to when you had your first paycheck. For me, I was delivering boxes for UPS um, around the holiday time, um, back where, where I was in high school in Denver, Colorado. Um, that was my first paycheck. And there, you know, th this, this is a, a symbolic, you know, moment of you getting your first paycheck it has your name on it it has a dollar sign next to it and you're looking at it and this is definitely my first reaction right it, it, it's hype it's excitement it's it, it's it's game time we did it we got it we're about to get to this bread right then once you look a little bit closer this is more like what mine looked like like i said i, I deliver box for ups you, you you get past the check and you start looking at, at, at the actual statement that comes with it or the base stuff that's attached to it. And you start noticing these things, you know, most importantly, that's on the right side, right? FICA, med tax, FICA, SS tax, fed tax, MDST tax. You know, beforehand, you may not know what this is, but then you look at your net pay all the way at the bottom right corner and you're looking at it like, oh, well, well, hold on, what, what happened? I, I, was, I was getting paid, you know, 15 an hour and it looks like I'm only coming home with 11 or 12 where did all my money go obviously a lot of that went to taxes and if this is your first paycheck you may not have known that obviously a lot of folks here you know if you've had your first paycheck you've had this experience as an employee but the exact same thing happens to business owners who don't plan for their tax as well the exact same thing at a very 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 worst level can happen if you have a thriving notary business that you've been building you've taken Ms. Head's courses you've taken notary one-on-one, you become a loan signing agent, you're starting to get into the mix um, and you don't plan at all for your taxes, you're gonna look like crap at the end because you're gonna be surprised at how much you owe. The, the, you know, there was nobody who kind of did your taxes for you, how they do it for employees. And so this moment that, that I had when I got my first paycheck is what we're gonna try to prevent by the end of the day, okay? We wanna prevent people from not being surprised or phased or, or kind of burdened with a big tax bill because you didn't do your plan, okay? Uh, last game we're gonna play, we, we did, the, we did the, 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 the trip in memory lane to your first paycheck. Um, we're gonna play a little Would You Rather. Very easy game, and it should be, there, there is a correct answer, I think, especially for folks who are business-minded, right? So would you rather be an employee, right? And then this is the life of an employee. You make money, you pay taxes on what you make. Pretty simple, right? You, you get it right on your pay step, you get it right with your paycheck. And then you kind of try to make ends meet with whatever that's left, right? You, 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 you know, some folks, you know, you might save some of that money, but ultimately you're paying bills, you're taking care of kids, um, you know, you're, you're, you're putting gas in the tank, you're doing all these things after you pay your taxes on your income. So that, that's one thing that you can do, right? Would you rather be an employee or the other side of that is as an entrepreneur, as a business owner or as a self-employed contractor, would you like to make money, then get to spend, save and invest back into your business and then only actually pay taxes on whatever's left. And most people, you know, when they see this visual aren't super phased, they're kind of like, okay, yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Like, I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe I would prefer to be an entrepreneur, but I want you to imagine if you were able to go to work, you had a regular job, W2, and then pay all of your rent, then pay for all of your food, then pay for all of your gas, then pay for all of the mileage you do in your car, then pay for all of these expenses, 
And then the IRS only taxes you on the little bit that's left in your paycheck, which for some people, if you live in a paycheck to paycheck, is zero. Right? We couldn't even imagine that as an employee. However, that is the reality that you have as an entrepreneur. You are allowed to make money, sales, right? When you, when you conduct signings, you're allowed to spend that, right? On, on things related to your business, whether that's gas, whether those are cars, whether that's investing in retirement uh, accounts specifically set up for self-employed people, whether that's investing in IRAs, you can do all of that. And then you only need to pay taxes on whatever's left. So this alone is the big mindset that, that entrepreneurs need to have is that we're no longer employees. We don't, we don't pay taxes just off of the revenue, right? We would never judge a business just based on the revenue. What we care about as business people is profit. And what the IRS cares about as it comes to taxes is profit. So we need to be very strategic about this spend, save, and invest category on the right side because this is where big corporations like Amazon pay $0 in yeah. taxes. This is where big corporations like uh, Apple don't pay anything. In taxes. You can't tell me it's because they're not making a lot of money, right? A lot of people have iPhones. A lot of people have Apple Watch, Apple Bloodline, Apple Heart Rate, Apple everything basically these days. So you can't tell me that Apple's not making money, but somehow they're not paying taxes. It's just because they're learning how to play this game, right? Different game than it is as an employee, okay? So that's a mindset that I, that I want you to have is that we're not playing the game of employees anymore. Right? You have a whole different level of freedom as, as a business owner, as a self-employed uh, contractor, okay? Now we're going to kind of dial into to the more important things. So, so if you do have a pen and paper, this is around the time where I think you should start getting that out. Obviously, I don't, I don't know if there's a way to me that I can send this presentation out or, or whatever. I'm actually I'm recording it. You're recording. So yeah. we ain't even going to worry about it, right? People, people can go back and look at it. Which taxes do notaries have to pay, right? Which ones, right? And then there's one part in particular that'll be abundantly clear that I want you to pay attention to, right? So there are a bazillion types of taxes, right? And this is one-on-one. We don't necessarily need to go into all of them. Right. Federal income taxes is, is what we call Uncle Sam. It's what we usually call the IRS. It's what most people engage with. State income tax isn't really relevant. I don't know where everybody is. Right. They could be anywhere in the country. But here in Texas, we're blessed that we don't need to really pay state income tax, which is great. Um, and then we have all of these other types of taxes that you could have a business tax, which in Texas is called a franchise tax. Um, you could have property tax if your business owns you know, a, a storefront, if you're a brick and mortar. Um, you could have use tax. And, and sales tax, depending on what businesses you are and what state you're in. Um, but the main thing I wanna focus on are these FICA taxes, which is Social Security and Medicare. That's what was a part of two of the lines on that pay stub from UPS that I used as an example from my first job. Now, there are some veterans on here. Do, do any veteran notaries why FICA taxes is much bigger and why it's in yellow? as it relates to notaries. And then if you don't know, that's fine, right? Obviously why I'm here. But I'm, I'm wondering if anybody knows automatically why. why. Why did I highlight those types of taxes? Keep in mind, y'all, I teach middle school math and I gotta get, I gotta get my kids to wait a long time. So I'm, <laughs> I'm patient. No worries at all. That means I'm in the right pace. The reason why FICA taxes are highlighted in yellow and really big, and why I want you to remember this, is because notaries don't need to pay them. You don't have to pay them. Very. You don't need to pay them. Now, we're going to get a lot more specific on what that actually means. But it's important for you to know you are, you are an agent of the state, right? You, you are a, a public official in pretty much every sense, right? You don't need to pay these FICA taxes. Now, I'm going to be very specific here on what that actually means. Now, this is primarily information for folks who want to know more about taxes, which is why we're here. Um, my hope is that everybody who did, who's been a notary who doesn't really know what I'm talking about at least has a tax preparer who does know that this exists. And hopefully you can look back at your return and see that this happens, right? But notaries don't need to pay FICA or, or what, another term for it is self-employment taxes, right? This is 15.3% that people who do not work a W-2 have to pay, right? Normally when you work for a job, your employer pays half of it and, you're, and you as an employee pay a part of it, right? That's the, the, the social security and Medicare tax that takes out of your paycheck. Notaries don't have to do that, right? So think about if you make $100,000 as a, as, a, as, a, as a tax preparer, me, right? Before I get my notary business, I gotta pay 15.3% on that profit, right? So that's 15,300 bucks. Um, right. Hey, could I ask a question? Since we don't have to pay, since we don't have to pay FICA, 
which is uh, Social Security. So we're not yep. paying into Social Security. So that means that when we reach retirement age, ah, you you won't need to you won't need to worry about. I, I, I let me let me make sure I understand your question. We're not paying into Social Security. So does that mean we don't get any at the end? Of, at the end of this? No, 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 that's not the case. And that's not how our social security system is set up, right? Okay. It's not set up that, that whatever you put in is directly what you get out. Um, other countries do it that way. Ours is a little bit more complicated, but no, you don't need to worry about that. It's not as if you're missing out um, or as if you should voluntarily pay social security taxes so that you can get social security. You don't need to worry about it. This is literally okay. IRS gives notaries an exemption knowing that they're doing a service for the state. Um, this is one of the very few uh, tax benefits that has stayed since a lot of the changes in 2017, 29, uh, 2018. Um, but this is a great one for notaries. Now, I want to be very specific on what this means with FICA taxes and what I mean by notaries don't have to pay them. Okay? And this is the part especially that you want to take notes. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I hope people will remember, hey, this dude hopped on a webinar and, who does taxes and said, I don't have to pay them. Let's be abundantly clear what we're talking about. Right? I want to make it abundantly clear to everybody. Right? Public notaries do not need to pay self-employment or FICA taxes on the money they make for notarial acts. And as simple as I can as I can give it, based on what I know from my notary 101 class with Tamika and Musir, is this would be everything that is on that schedule that you have to put in your ledger that you charge maybe six bucks for the original one, one or two dollars for each additional signature. All of those 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 prices that you get from the state that you don't really get to set. That's what we're talking about. That's the actual notorial act that we're doing, right? It, it is the charge that the state says that you can make, uh, that you can sell for putting your stamp on a piece of paper. What this does not include are things like charging people 50 bucks to go to their house, right? And then if you, if you do general notary work and you're in mobile notary, a lot of your money comes from these kind of tangential services that you provide, right? Whether it's meeting somebody somewhere or coming to somebody's house or offering somebody, um, if, you, if you have like the, the, the different types of notary papers on hand, maybe you could charge for something like that, right? Um, but, but this does not include those, what I call convenience fees, right? So if you charge people to meet you somewhere, that's not what's included. Right? That's not what's included in what you don't have to pay taxes on. And this is not super important if, for, for you to know. It's more important for you and your planning, right? It's my job as your tax preparer to know how to do this on your taxes, so I'm not going to get into how to do it. But you need to know the difference of what you're not paying taxes in, right? You're not paying taxes on that $10, $12, $6 that you get as you do hundreds of appointments throughout the year, right? But that big chunk of 50 bucks that you get for being an excellent service that comes to your house, that, that takes care of you, especially during COVID-19, that takes extra precautions, that isn't necessarily, by the IRS standards, a notorial act, right? So that's not what's exempt from FICA taxes, right? What this also does not mean is that notaries just don't pay taxes on their money, right? If you sign up to be a notary, even if you made a million bucks doing something else, I don't have to pay taxes because Ray said notaries don't pay taxes, right? That's not what that means you still need to put all of the income, right? All of the income that you make from your notarial acts, it needs to be on your tax return. Every single thing, and, and notary should be excellent at this because you, we have to bookkeep everything, right? Every single thing has to be in your schedule already. So your tax preparer should love you, right? They, you should have every single receipt, every single thing that you need, all of it still needs to be in there. There's just this slight exemption for FICA taxes, for notaries, specifically on notarial acts. Right. So, so it's a great thing, right? That 15, 15.3% over the course of a year can mean quite a bit of change that you get to keep. But what that doesn't mean is that notaries are just having a party while everybody else is stressing on tax day, right? You, you still need to put all of your income on your return. I'll show you the different taxes you still need to pay on it. But that 15.3% that employees and employers and everybody else like myself who, who's, who, who works for themselves, you don't have to pay that, which is great. Which is great. I think I think that that's a, it's a, a wonderful thing um, for notaries to have. So um, this this is the biggest thing that that's different about notaries, right? I, I'm trying to specialize this for folks who are in the practice as much as possible. Obviously, we brushed over a bazillion different tax things we could have talked about and taxes we could have brought up. But this is the thing that applies to all notaries that I wanted to make sure that we know because most people just don't know it. Most people are just like, oh yeah, I just kind of pay my taxes. I, I just go off and do it. I don't really look at it when my preparer sends it to me. Um, 
I'll talk a little bit about the myth of a tax refund maybe at the end, and I don't want to get on my rant about it, but essentially you're getting played, right? I get 2000 bucks back, I pay my preparer, and I don't really care about whatever exemptions. I want you to know that you're entitled to this. Right? You, you are entitled to not having to pay that 15 3% on a service that you're doing for the public as, as a public agent. Um, okay, so that, that, is, that is the big taxes is that notaries do not need to pay FICA taxes on notarial acts, right? Payments that you get for notarial acts does not include convenience fees. When do notaries have to pay taxes? Now, this isn't specific to notaries, but it, it, it's relevant, obviously, for us. It is relevant to all people who either own, operate, run a business, right? And most people honestly don't do it. Businesses are supposed to pay taxes four times a year. All right. The April 15th is, is one of four tax days. April 15th is for the everyday worker, right? Employees, which is a vast majority of people in this country. Um, obviously, this year it's pushed back to July 15th. So you have two more weeks to do so if you need to. Um, but businesses are actually supposed to pay four times a year, right? You're supposed to pay on the 15th of April for everything from the first quarter. And then everything from the second quarter, you're supposed to pay on June 15th, third quarter, September 15th. And then that fourth quarter up until New Year's Day, you pay on the following January. So two weeks after New Year's, you pay on January 15th for the previous year, right? And so for this year, um, those first two deadlines, April and June, don't exist, right? You need to pay estimated quarterly taxes as a business for your, for your business on July 15th. So for everybody's tax day this year is all the same. July 15th is when you need to pay estimated quarterly taxes for quarter one and two. Now, the reason why most people look like Craig, like I did, like I looked like when I got my first uh, pay stub is because people didn't do this, right? Think about it. If you're an employee, you're getting taxes taken out every time you get paid, regardless of how often your pay period is. Let's say it's every other week, right? You're paying taxes every other week. Your employer is sending it to the IRS. But if you're a business and you're out here hustling your money and you're making a lot of money and you're making a profit and you're doing your thing, when did you stop to pay taxes? Right? It's not as if the IRS all of a sudden forgot or, or, or doesn't know. They just don't know when to take your money, right? They, they just don't know when, right? We know employees get paid every other week, so they know when to take that money, right? And that's an employer's responsibility, right? But for businesses, you need to pay an estimated quarterly payment four times a year. And then you could still get a refund, right? If you overestimate, um, which is a wise decision, I think. Overestimate by a little bit. And when you pay four times a year, then when you do file, you won't owe a ridiculous amount of money. Um, but most people, especially in their first couple of years when they start a business, or most people who just join, jump all in to the life as an entrepreneur, just kind of accept defeat with taxes. They're just kind of like, oh, yeah, man, I always owe now. Ever since I did this, man, I, I always just owe on my taxes, and I never get anything back. And, and so, yeah, I just get my stuff done, man, and I don't really, you know, I don't really think much about it. IRS doesn't like me. I'm, I must not be doing something right. No, it's literally you're just on a different schedule, right? Employees get the convenience of having somebody else pay their taxes for them. As a business owner, that's a new responsibility and accountability that you need to be doing four times a year, okay? The exact same thing that happens here, right? If you do this four times a year, you won't need to, right? But if you are educated on your taxes, you won't look like this, right? You will have know that all of those FICA taxes that you see on the right side, all those Fed tax, all of those things that, that, that is paid per pay period for employees, you need to do it just four times a year, right? It takes a little bit of extra planning, but it'll save you a whole lot of headache every single tax season when you're confused why you always owe thousands of dollars. Well, it's because you ain't paid the IRS not, right? And, and depending on when, if your notary business really takes off, right? They have a threshold of if you don't pay your quarterly taxes and you're in, in this is the IRS is thinking, right? People who make a lot of money, we need them to pay their taxes because that's how we get a majority of our revenue. Folks who don't make a lot of money, eh, you know, well, we're not going to get a lot from them. But once you start making a good amount of money, the IRS is going to pay attention when you don't pay, right? And, and I'm not going to I'm not going to put nobody on the spot, right? We got 22 people on here. I'm not going to do a percentage of the people who actually do pay quarterly taxes versus people who don't, right? But I want you to keep in mind that if if you want to take your business seriously and you want to get to a serious level of profit, you know, no different than anything, once you start attracting attention, big wigs are going to pay attention, right? So so be keep in mind that you can get a penalty for not paying your taxes quarterly, right? Because that's money that the IRS is expecting to get, right? They don't have to wait on it for employees. They know they're going to get it, right? But you need to be paying four times a year, right? And you need to either have somebody who's your bookkeeper, your tax professional, or somebody, or if you, if you, if you handle your books on your own, you need to be doing a calculation of, okay, normally, based on how much money I anticipate to make, this is how much I'm going to make. Easy way to do it, you can divide it by four and make that payment.
right? Or if you know that you have a peak season, right? Like for us as tax professionals, we know the peak seasons at the beginning of the year, you can pay, right? Maybe for me, that April and June um, tax payment is gonna be higher, right? Than September and January, because at the end of the year, less people are filing their taxes, most people took care of it, right? So, so things to be thinking about, but the main thing that most people don't do, but everybody who's, who's, whose business is getting at a, a pretty significant level will have to do is start paying those quarterly taxes, okay? Um, next thing is how. How do you get taxed, right? You, 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 you don't get it taken out of your paycheck. We just talked about you do have to pay it four times a year, but, but how, how does that work, right? And the number one thing that influence how that works is how you're structured, right? At any point, I, my hope is that if, you, if, you, if you've done your taxes with somebody or if you've had a conversation with somebody about your taxes, especially as it relates to your business, the first question they should ask you is how are you structured? Which one of these are you? Are you a sole proprietorship? Are you a limited liability company, LLC? Are you a partnership? Are you cooperative? S Corp, C Corp, are you a franchise? How are you structured? Because that determines everything about how you get taxed, right? All of these entities get taxed very, very differently, right? Sole proprietorship is the default. That's where if you just wake up one day and start making money for yourself, you're a sole proprietorship. Congratulations, you don't need to work for that, right? LLC is the buzz term of, of, of the day. Everybody's like, oh yeah, you gotta get your LLC. You gotta get official. You, you want that, those three letters next to your name. I have an LLC. So I have no knock against LLCs, but most people know about that. Partnership is if you split, if you have two, or I mean, not just two, but most often if you have two business owners, that's a partnership. Cooperative is when you incorporate more people. S Corp and C Corps are ways to transition your company into a corporation to take advantage of new tax benefits that everything in the middle, these middle four, don't get access to. Um, and then obviously you could be a nonprofit, right? There are a lot of nonprofits or, or community organizations who offer notary services to, to the community so they can take care of them, right? That matters in how you get taxed, right? So before we talk about, you know, what tax credits, what deductions, what you need, this is the most important conversation that you need to have with yourself or whoever you, you handle your business affairs with is how should I'd be structured. I haven't, if you've done nothing, you're a sole proprietorship, right? You're, you're, you're middle top left right there, right? If you file for an LLC, you also need to know as an LLC, what type of LLC are you? Are you still taxed as a single member LLC? So that means you're a sole proprietorship or do you and your spouse own the business? That means you're taxed as a partnership. That's a 1065. Or did you already transition and elect to be taxed as an S corp, which means you need an 1120 S, right? C corp is 1120. Right? These are conversations that you need to have, and someone needs to sit down with you. I'd be more than happy to do this with whoever has questions. Someone needs to sit down and break down to you what all these things mean. We have no time right now to do so because the vast majority of people, right, you need to get to a certain level of, of, of steady revenue and income with your business in order to start transitioning to these, and this will actually benefit you. Um, but this is an important question. This is the first question that any tax professional should ask you is this, okay? I want to remind us of this, right? Employees make money, and then you pay taxes on your income, and then you find a way to make ends meet with the rest. Entrepreneurs, they make money. You can spend it, you can save it in, under a business account, you can invest it as a business, and then you only pay taxes on whatever is left. Now, you only get to take advantage of these things if you have your books in order. Notaries should, th this should be light work for notaries because y'all already do this every time you do a transaction. You literally, like, like most, most people, right? You can imagine, you may have friends who are entrepreneurs or you may have started other businesses. Especially if it's a cash business, people aren't really keeping track of receipts. People aren't keeping track of their books, right? Notaries, you, you literally by law are already excellent at this. So this shouldn't be an issue for you. But in order to take advantage of this amazing setup to where you can make money, pay for your rent, pay for your food and all these things and only pay tax on the end, you got to have your books in order, right? You need to be tracking all of the income you receive. Your, 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 your book or your ledger will help with that. Um, and mainly all of the expenses, right? The question you need to ask is how will your business keep its book up to date? It doesn't just happen. You can't just sign up for QuickBooks, uh, you know, attach your bank account and then poof, your books are done. This is not how that works whatsoever. You need to be thinking about how are you going to do this? Because I, I can't help you take advantage of any tax benefits if you don't have receipts for me to use, right? That puts both of us at risk, okay? So here are some bookkeeping one-on-ones. Get a separate bank account, right? You, you may have seen this if, if you Google or if, if you write on it. This will help you and your tax professional huge if they know they only need to look at one place for everything related to your business, right? I already banked at Wells Fargo. That's where I banked for my personal stuff since I was a kid. I went up to them and said, hey, I'm starting a new business. Can I open a business bank account? 
yeah, sure, right, no problem. Here's some paperwork. It was done. You don't need to, you shouldn't need to pay for it, right? Depending on what bank you use. You shouldn't need to pay for it. You should set up a bank account plan to where you don't need to pay a fee every single month. You, you should be strategic on which one you use. Some of them do charge, but you should have ways to get that out of the way. That's not something that you need to be worrying about. It's paying for someone to hold on to and make money off of your own money, right? You shouldn't need to do that, okay? Getting a separate bank account is key, okay? And using that business business card for business purposes only okay maybe your business blows up right and you got a lot of money in your account and it's it's so and so's birthday next week and you want to get them something nice and you don't take the time to transfer that money or to figure out a way to budget properly to use your personal thing you're like well i got my business debit card on me i know it has the money let me just go ahead and buy them the gift and you know it is what it is huge red flag we need to keep our personal finances and our business finances as separate as possible now there are ways that you can transfer money between accounts right so so if you have you know all of your business and personal accounts at one bank you can transfer money in between and you'll want to make sure your bookkeeper has a way of tracking that transaction uh, but it's super super vital that you only use your business card for business purposes only right this is audit red flag irs agents have a field day when they see a whole bunch of expenses and a bunch of deductions for things that they, they like, they know notaries, right? They know how much a notary should be making and they know what types of expenses notaries have. So if they see a brand new Bugatti, you know, on your, on your tax return and you say, Oh, well, you know, I, I take it to, to, to do my appointments, right? I, I want to make an impression. Honestly, I, that, that's not a bad sell. I think you might be able to get away with something like that related to your car, especially if you're a mobile notary. But I think y'all are getting the idea is that, you don't want to get caught up in having personal things on your business account, right? Your business is held to a different level of accountability and responsibility than your regular bank account, right? So you want to make sure you're only using it for business purposes. This will help your bookkeeper and your tax professional a lot. Please make sure that everything related to the business is somewhere in your books, right? Whether it's, whether you pay for it on your debit card or whether you have a receipt for anything you paid for in cash or whether you have ATM deposits for when you took cash and then put it inside of the business bank account, please, please, please make sure that everything related to your business is on this account. Right? It makes everything easier for you. It's make everything easier for me. It makes everything easier for the IRS to not yell back at you, right? Everything is good when you are keep your stuff organized and separate. And like I said, notaries are already A1 at this, right? Y'all shouldn't have any issues with this, okay? Um, and this is the last thing, please don't wait until the end of the year or even worse, right? Let's say you don't even wait to the end of the year. Cause honestly, I could handle if you waited to the end of the year, please don't wait until April 15th at 11:59 PM, right before tax day, right? Right on tax day to get your books in order. So you can file your taxes. Please don't wait to do so. Right. An easy thing for notaries. That would be like me telling you, you know what, just do a bunch of notary assignments. And then at the end of the month, just kind of go off of the head with what you remember and then write those in your ledger, write those in your book. Oh yeah, I did that one lady for this jury and then I did that one lady, she had a couple signatures and, and this other lady I charged the convenience fee for because I had to go to her house and then we actually had to make two trips so I had to double charge her. Let me Don't go off of the head and try to remember. Please don't wait. This is an ongoing thing that you need to be doing, right? With my bookkeeping clients, we meet once a week for 15 minutes and I literally go through and say, hey, does everything look good? Okay, have a great week. And that's it, right? You you should be in constant communication with either your bookkeeper, your accountant, or if you're doing this on yourself, this is something that you want to be mining consistently, right? End of the year and tax day are not the days when you want to call somebody freaking out and be like, hey, I need my taxes done. Can you get my books in order, all right? And that's not the time to do so, all right? Please don't wait to do so. And five, if this is not for you, please don't pretend like it's for you. If your business is really leveling up like how it should be, you shouldn't be wasting your time doing your books anyway. Pay somebody to do it, all right? There are a bunch of, I mean, QuickBooks is obviously one. Zero is one. Wave is one. Obviously, Priority Finance. I can help you do your books if, if you'd like to, right? There are a bunch of people out here who know how to do books well, who study this in school, who know how to do accounting, and who don't charge a whole lot to do so, right? It's, it's no differently than paying for, for th this is bookkeeping. Hiring a bookkeeper is like buying health insurance for your family or buying home insurance on your home. I, hypothetically, nothing should happen to your health, we hope. Obviously, current times have said that we can't really rely on any of that certainty, right? Hopefully, nothing happens to your home. But would you not put a little bit down for that little bit of certainty? Or would you like to pay somebody rather than trying to pretend that you know what you're doing, right? If you, didn't, if you, if you don't understand bookkeeping, if you didn't understand accounting, if you don't know the difference between cash and accrual accounting, if you don't know the difference between, you know, how, to, how invoices should show up in your income report, if you don't know where 
your net income and retained earnings should show up on your balance sheet. If none of those things make sense to you, don't pretend like you know. You wouldn't pretend to be a doctor and then give a prescription to your friend just because you didn't want to pay a doctor and go to the doctor. Please don't pretend like you know how to do your books, right? If you're running a business that's doing well, this is a huge thing that could completely destroy everything you build, right? When it comes tax time and your tax preparer is looking at this and like, look, man, I can't, I can't give you much confidence that this is not going to red flag something, right? There's no way that you can be a notary that's, that's doing all these things and has all these expenses and you telling me you only made a thousand bucks over the course of the whole year, right? But you you're you're deducting fifty thousand dollars in expenses. What like what 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 are you doing, right? They're like what do you, you need to hire somebody who can do this for you, right? If one two three four seem a little bit difficult for you, I can be your five, right? I can be your five. But either way, it needs to get done. Okay. The top things the of expenses that you need to make sure that you track for notaries. Okay. I'm gonna put all all the list on here. Um, so people can, can kind of write these down and I'll walk through them, right? Um, for me, something I'm going to do in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to go on the National Notary Association website. I'm going to fill out my application to be in a uh, general notary in Texas. And I'm going to pay 200, 300, whatever that is. If you keep that receipt, even better, if you already have your business bank account and you swipe that card to do that, that's an expense off the, off, off the bat that you, can, that you can deduct. Whatever money it took for you to get into this notary game, deduct it. Okay. If you took Ms. Harris' course, if you took a, a course with Ms. Harris, Harris as well, you can deduct that. Right? This is part of your training. It's part of your education. This is part of you getting your game up, investing back into your business. That's an expense that you need to make sure that you have a receipt for. Right? No reason you got to spend a whole lot of money on supplies and materials. Right? Obviously, you got to get your book. You got to get your stamp. You got to have pens. You got to have paper. You got to have ink. You got to have a printer. If you're, if you really own it, right, for these low sign, uh, like I've heard about these low signing agents who bring a scannable printer to the thing with them that's like mobile, that doesn't even plug in, right? I know that thing costs you a chunk of change. Make sure you have the receipt for it because you can deduct all that money on it. So you can just scan the documents. It'll send you an email. You don't even have to go back to the office to print nothing. Right, which is which is absolutely fantastic, right? All of the supplies and materials that you use to do your job, you need to have all that on that business debit card, right? You or you need to have receipts for it. Um, and then any advertisement you do, right? If if you're if you're telling people that you're a notary, right? Or if you're doing, you know, maybe maybe it's 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 maybe you're on Instagram, right? For instance, and you can boost posts or you can promote posts on Instagram, and you can pay for that. You can pay for it on social media as well. Those expenses are things that, that you want to keep track of that you can deduct, right? If you have business cards, right? All your business cards, regardless of what you do, if you're a notary, you probably should have the you're a notary somewhere on it, right? It probably should be somewhere on the top of your website. If you're paying for a domain name for your website, if you're paying for somewhere to host your website. Um, if you're paying for some, some, I don't know, some premium package or that, whatever you might be paying for, all the supplies and materials and, and things that you do to run your business, all of that's got to be on that business account so that folks like myself can make it super easy to deduct it on your taxes. Right? Last thing, number four, is car mileage. Right? All of these other expenses are kind of one-time things. Right? When, when you sign up for a course, you pay for it, and then you get the receipt. Pretty simple. Pretty simple to keep track of that, right? But car mileage, especially if you're a mobile notary, especially if you're somebody who's traveling around, that can be a little bit more tedious to keep track of, right? And then I'll share a little bit about what I do. Um, in my free time, I drive for DoorDash, right? So, so I have to deduct my mileage for that, just when I when I, when I feel like doing so. Um, I'll share what I do, and then I'll share what a lot of other people on the internet will tell you to do um, that I don't really think is necessary, okay? Um, and it obviously depends on what kind of car you have. There are a bazillion different apps that you can download that will track your mileage. Right? I've tried nearly all of them. I personally don't like them. I don't like that it doesn't really know when I do a trip and I have to kind of keep clicking it over and over and over again. And, and, and maybe I just haven't found the right app, but, but the, the apps, app thing doesn't really work for me as it relates to deducting mileage with my car. Right? What I like to do, and this is what my car does, I don't know whether your car does, is I can reset the trip mileage whenever I want. All right, my car has like trip one, trip two. I can just press a little button that resets it all back to zero. And whenever I'm going to an appointment, I just keep it on until I get home. And then I write that down. Right, I have a, little, I have a little, little sheet where I just write it down, okay, here's the date, here's how many miles. My car just told me. Right? Rather than having to download another app have another person have access to your data, get a whole a bunch of other emails, and really all those mileage apps, even though they're free, are just ways for them to try to sell you a different product that you then have to pay for. Rather than having to deal with all that, that is the most simple way that I've found to deduct mileage.
right? And for most folks, deducting mileage is, is the best thing rather than deducting expenses. You can also, this is more tedious, keep track of every time you fill up your tank, every time you have to get an oil change, every time you get a car wash, every time you, um, you know, obviously something big happens to your car. Now, what you would then have to do is figure out what percentage of those expenses can be attributed to business and what percentage are attributed to personal, right? But when I click that little button that resets it every time I do a business-related mileage trip, it's really easy for me to know these miles are for business. It's not like I made a couple stops on the way. I am looking at my car tell me on this trip, I went this distance. Pretty simple. All I got to do is remember to write it down. I don't need to remember to click nothing in the app. I don't need to be looking at something while I'm driving and be dangerous and on my phone, right? Like, like too many of us, including myself, are. I don't need to worry about any of those things. The other thing that your tax professional needs to know and that you should also know is that once you make a decision on one of these things, you got to stick with it. Let me give you an example. If you have a car that gets great gas mileage, like my car, I have a really good, nice car that gets great gas mileage, you should be doing the mileage one, right? The reason why is because you can deduct the mileage and you get you know a little over 50 cents almost 60 cents per mile but you're not paying a whole lot in gas right so so the 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 gas deduction would be lower for you because you don't pay a lot right you don't have to go to, you don't have to go to the pump as much right i recommend doing mileage but let's say next year uh i get into a really bad wreck and um it's somebody else's fault they ain't got insurance so i i gotta figure out a way to get my car fixed and that costs me two thousand dollars you know, me trying to be savvy in my tax and in, in, with taxes is going to think, oh, well, let me just get my business car fixed and I can deduct $2,000, right? I already got to pay $2,000 to fix my car anyway. Let me just deduct that. The IRS is like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. You deducted miles last year. Even if something crazy happens to your car, you got to do it again, right? So once you pick something, you got to stick with it for future years, right? They, they don't want people flopping, you know, going back and forth, choosing what years is, did your car cost you a lot of money because you got into a wreck versus what years did you get great gas mileage? The IRS doesn't want people playing that game. So you got to choose whichever one is best for your car, right? I recommend folks who, for like most of us who drive, you know, like family cars or, you know, like regular cars, um, most cars get decent gas mileage. Right? Most cars get decent gas mileage. Now, if you run a business, um, like, uh, like a business that has a service van, right? Or if you have a big truck, the text diesel, that's a different conversation, right? Because just by the nature of your vehicle that you need for your business, you won't get great, great gas mileage, but you're going to have to pay more in gas each time in order to use it. So I would recommend using expenses. So it's all about a decision that you and your tax preparer need to sit down and make which one is best for you. But just know once you make one, you made one, right? And most likely folks who have already tried to deduct mileage on here, whether it's for mobile notary, Uber, Lyft, you know, DoorDash, Instacart, any of those things, your tax preparer or you or TurboTax and H&R Block or whatever system you use probably made the decision for you. So you need to keep in mind that if you come back and say, oh, no, I had to get a new new front bumper that cost me whatever, why can't I deduct that? And the IRS is going to be like, because you already made the decision. The, you, you can't do that. Okay. So these are the top four things. Whatever cost it takes you in your state, I, mean, I don't know if everyone's in Texas, but you know, whatever cost it takes you to sign up to become a notary with the state, um, whatever education or training that I highly recommend that you get um, to, to be a notary, you can deduct that as well. And then all of the supplies and materials, anything that relates to, to running your business, and then the car, right? Making a decision between mileage and expenses. I keep track of both. If this is your first year, I would keep track of both and then decide which one is best for you, right? Um, Expenses will be somewhat easier to keep track of because you will already pay for gas anyway, right? Whereas you might forget to turn on that trip mileage or you might forget to turn on that app. You might forget to do something related to mileage. So expenses should already be there. But mileage is a huge thing that you don't even have to keep receipts for. You need to write um, it. Ray, be diligent with that. Yeah. I, I think I heard you say um, once you decide how you're going to um, how you're going to count your mileage, you have to stick with that. Now, right. is that forever, or is there a time when you can switch from one thing to the other? Well, so, so I'll, I'll put it like this. You, you need to make a decision on whether you're going to deduct your car mileage versus most often for people it's gas, car wash, and, and tune-ups, right? Now, if you transition your business to something else, for instance, if I door dash, and then I become a notary. That could be different things to the IRS. If you get a new car, you could make a different decision, right? If you have different cars, 
that you use. That could be a different decision. So, so when, I, when I say it's forever, I, I do mean to say that the IRS wants you to make a decision. But what I'm, what I'm trying to, 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 to suggest is that people, pe people know that this is the, one of the biggest deductions that they can make. And even the rich, wealthy corporations find ways to make sure that they pay the least amount in taxes. So we can, we, can, we can figure out, and I would be even willing to sit down with somebody to have a conversation with them is, what did your tax return look like last year? What did you choose to do? Was that the best decision? And are there ways for us to choose something else? Right. So, so it, 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 is a, it is a quote unquote indefinite decision. It is a decision that you wanna make, right? But um, it's not something that you can't, you can't work your way around. Okay, I can work my way around it. Yeah. Somebody just had a question in the chat. Yeah, um, let's see here. But let them know that they can just ask questions. Yeah. No, I mean we'll we'll, we'll sit we'll sit at the, I mean at the end that that's all that's all we'll that's all we'll be doing. Oh, so you don't you don't want us to ask questions during your presentation? Doesn't matter to me. I, I messed up. Man. No, 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 no ma'am, you're good. No, you're good. And it was, it, it was my job as an educator to make sure that, 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 I, that I made that clear, right? So, so I missed that. That, that, was, that was me as a teacher slipping up a bit, oh. right? I've been out of practice with quarantine, right? Your, your students got to know, do I ask questions now or do I ask them later, right? Is it okay to do... Oh, see, my, oh I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was just reading uh, Miss Diana's question. Is it okay to do car mileage and the car washes? Um, and so I, I don't know when that when that question came through, but that's the decision that you need to make, right? You yeah, can, Ray? See. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. so I've chosen to do the car mileage versus the expenses. You know, I don't expense out the tires or the tune-ups or the right. oil changes. I just do mileage. But since I do use my vehicle, you know, uh, and even just today, I did a, a, um, a single affidavit notary in the, the, uh, the back of my, my SUV, I opened the lid because she refused oh, to go gosh. into the local business. Okay. You know, she's not going in. So I, is it okay to go ahead and also deduct car washes? Now, car washes, uh, by the book, you, you need to make a decision whether you want to do gas, tune-ups, washes, or okay. Mileage, right? Okay. Now, now you're, you're getting into something that I didn't really think about, right? There are a lot of businesses that are, that, that, you know, people operate out of people's trunks, but notary is not one I, I thought about. Might be <laughs> right. So it was the first time today that I've done that. Well, I, you you piqued my interest in a way that I I don't think I've been piqued before, especially in COVID nineteen. You might be onto something. Um, yeah. And so, so I I will say this for folks like some people I don't know people might drive Uber or Lyft, and this is a conversation I have with people. Who, is that things like you if you choose to do mileage, you can't do things like you know your 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 oil okay. change and stuff yeah. like that. But if you, if you pay to have things in your car that are related to your business, for instance, if you put snacks in your back seat for the people who drive, mm -hmm. who, who, who you right. drive around with Uber, that's deductible, right? Because that's no differently than if you had a storefront and you offered water to people when they, when they were in the waiting room maybe, or something like that, right? So, so I, I don't want to say that anything related to your car is off limits, right? There are Uber drivers who deduct things like chargers that they have in their car, the snacks. Some some crazy Uber drivers have lights and things and yeah. cameras and, and party, all these, party all these things they do. Right, right, right. They make it a whole party lift, party Uber, party whatever, right? You can deduct some of those things, right? But but basically what the IRS is saying is the cost for operating your vehicle, right? For the cost for doing its basic task of moving you from one place to another, you gotta make a decision. But all these other specs and accessories, like you you piqued my interest to, to wanna do some digging. Uh, if you do if, if you're car then becomes your business a place of business. portable office i guess right, right. Mm -hmm. like your trunk what does that <laughs> mean for i mean you got to keep your office clean why can't you pay for a car wash to keep your car clean you know um so so yeah I, I'm, I'm i'm gonna do some digging and and and, and if, if we can we, let, let's reconnect and maybe i'll have some okay. more answers for you i, I hadn't thought thank about you that. all righty yeah no problem no problem okay um these are the top things not the only things you could have a bazillion other things that you do, for instance, right? I'll take uh, Miss Harris and Miss Harris, right? They, uh, Miss Harris has this fancy mic that she has, that she does with all of her presentations. My hope is that she paid for that with a business card because every single time I've seen her on camera, she uses it. Well, I will say it was a gift. So I, I did not buy it. Ah, okay, okay. Well, so then you don't need to worry about it. 
Right. <laughs> you, you got it, right? If you got it on, then, then, then you do your thing, right? But I'm thinking things like office chairs, right? Well, my right. ring light, my right. ring light, my chair. Boom. Exactly. All of all of those things, right? If like for me, I need to buy a new computer that's gonna handle a new tax software I'm gonna use, and I'm using that computer purely for business purposes. Best believe that's gonna be a big expense for me, a big investment, and I'm not paying any taxes on that. Right? <laughs> you need to be thinking, what are the things that I use for my business? And how if I have receipts for them, I don't need to pay taxes on them. That employers can't really do that. Can't really do that in the same way. This is the beauty that, that big corporations take advantage of that, that, that we as, as small business owners, as self-employed folks, need to step up our game on. Is that if you have something and it's essential to your business and you paid for it, please don't pay taxes on it. Please don't give a donation to the government that already really don't care about you. Right? There, 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 there's, no reason, there's no reason to do so. Okay? Um, there's one other thing. And, and, and I, like I said, I took Notary 101 some uh, I'm new to the notary world, but I wanted to ask the veterans and Miss Head especially, um, if you've had this conversation with your tax preparer, depending on how much time a notary spends in their home, right? There's a home office deduction that you can do, right? If you run your business from your home, you can deduct, I mean, you could, you could, you could parcel out the percentages of your rent, utilities, of your phone bill, of your Wi-Fi. You could do a whole lot of things. Or you can do it the simple way, and you can take five bucks for the square feet that your office is. So let's say this is my office, and it's this little portion of my house. This is where I do business stuff. I can do a home office deduction. But said, do you know if notaries, especially mobile notaries, do, do they qualify to take advantage of that since I don't really feel like, are they doing business at home? I don't know what the everyday operation is like. Uh, I'm going to unmute myself and I can't find who needs to be muted. But um, absolutely, you take uh, my tax preparer. It takes um, basically, I have a room here in the house that Perfect. is my office. Exactly. And um, she uses a square footage yeah. of, of, right. of, of my, uh, my office. But then, of course, she also takes a percentage of my utilities, right? Of of my uh, uh, well, she all of the internet because basically I yeah, that's I'm a workaholic, so it, my internet is basically used for that. Right. My electricity, all of that, she takes into consideration. Perfect. Okay. She takes okay. a portion. You know, she has she takes right. she has a percentage that she uses for that. Okay, so that's good to know. I wasn't sure if because notaries, I guess, technically do a lot of their business outside of their home, even if maybe you have all your materials. Well, there. yeah, but, you know, we do. We, but here's the difference. My, my business, my work is loan signing more so than general notary work. So I do a lot of my work here. Like I have to print the documents here. You know, I, you know, I'm doing all of all of my prep work here before I get in the car and drive to the signing location. Exactly. exactly. So okay. yeah, I do a lot here. Okay. Okay. So let's make sure that we, we can't see number five, but number five definitely needs to be that home office deduction, right? If, if you're having somebody prepare your taxes for you, it sounds like Ms. Heads, um, a tax person who, who she's spoken very highly of in the past, has broken that down for us. She already knows what it is. If you have no idea what conversation we just had, you either need to figure it out if you plan on doing this on your own, or you need to get somebody who can who can do those percentages uh, for you. Okay. Here are some big overarching thing is that business income and expenses needs to be separate from personal. Business and personal need to be separate. And remember that FICA tax thing, right? Income from notarial acts needs to be separate from all of the other money that you make with your notary business. Meaning you need to have uh, kind of line itemed out. They paid me six bucks for the signature, but I also got paid 50 bucks to show up to their house. Or as Miss Diana is on, I got paid 50 bucks to pull up outside and open up my trunk. And then they met me in, in, in the trunk, right? You need to make sure you're separating and keeping all of those things organized. What was actually for a notorial act? What was for everything else so that you can claim that on your taxes? And it's the general thing for all business owners is you need to keep business and personal separate. Right. You need to have separate accounts, separate separate books for all those things. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Ray, now something. If you could just go back. Go back here. Okay, go back. One more. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. All right. 
you see, when we're talking the general notary work, and that six dollars, that's how you count it. And then your fifty dollar trip fee is over here, you don't count it. Right. Loan signing is a bit different. Right. It's a it's a bit more difficult diff it's a bit more difficult, I'm thinking, to separate. Right. Because we've got any number of notorial acts in a package right. and it doesn't necessarily equate to the six dollars for the first page and one dollar for the next page so forth and so on right. so what i'm going to ask you to do for us do for me is to look at that side of the spectrum to get and get a feel for how we could easily calculate what we can um, use for tax purposes. Right, right. And, and so is that something you would be willing to do? No, that is something I'd be willing to do. And it, it's, it's loan signing is something, as you know, is something I'm interested in. I just don't know a whole lot about. But this is my impression. I'll just send an impression on you. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll do some more digging, maybe even if we have some time um, while I'm sitting here, is that, um, the notary, the notary exemption to FICA tax is not general notary work. It is everybody who is a notary, which includes notary signing agents, right? So it's not to say that those loan signing, um, those things that you do for loan signing aren't included in that exemption. The only thing I don't know, which I appreciate you, you shedding light on, is whether they make that distinction, right? I know that for general notary work, it's easy to do so. I haven't never done a loan signing and had gotten an invoice from a title company before. Yeah, so I, yeah. I wasn't sure what that looked like. Yeah, it is yeah. that, you know, when you go on your, your general notary, you, you're doing that one document, you charge $6, and you charge a $50 trip fee, right. that's it. Right. On a loan signing, you've got 100 pages, and you may have 10 uh, notorial acts in there, right. but you got paid $120. Right. So being able to, I'm just wondering if it's necessary, because I have not done this, if it's necessary to break down those notorial acts and count it as the $6 or whatever, and then the rest of it is just uh, convenience for y'all. Right, right, exactly. And let, well, let, me, let me ask you a question, and I think this should answer, of course, but I'm going to do my due diligence. The state doesn't determine how much you charge for a loan signing. Right? No, they do not. I mean, if the only reason why the, the, the IRS is able to separate easily with the general notary is because they know how much the state tells you to charge. Gotcha. So if you have, when you, if, you're, if your notary business is to a certain level, they can estimate, they have computers of this, right? They can estimate how many notary, how many signings you did. And they know how much Texas charges, right? So, so if you're, you're a notary in Texas, they're going to know that. Especially if you're several years, they're going to know. Like, you've done this. But... If you are a loan signing agent, especially if you have a relationship with a title company and you, you just kind of go through them, um, I don't, I'm going to do my due diligence to make sure that I don't get you or anybody else in any kind of trouble, right? So I, th this is where I would pause and say this is not official tax advice. I don't see why you couldn't exempt all of that. Okay, well, I do, but I just wanted to make sure my tax preparer ain't, ain't setting me up. No, 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 no. And, and that's, a, that's a conversation that I, I, I need to do some digging on. You would never want, you know, you would never want to, to, to do it and not know for, for sure and with 100% confidence that it's okay to do. So even if you haven't done it, if your tax preparer shied away from it because they weren't sure, that was the wiser thing for them to do, right? It's much better to, to even though it doesn't seem like it in the business world, we got to be aggressive, but as it comes to the IRS and taxes, it's much better to be confident and safe and educate yourself up to the level to where you can do more creative things, right? Not just do them just because you're like, oh, I just want to do them, right? That, that's where you get in trouble. So we're, we're, let, let's come back to that. Hopefully before we wrap up, if not, I can, um, I can follow up with you, Ms. Ed. I appreciate that question. Miss Liz, yes, we had a hand raise. Uh, Ashley, did you have a question? And then Sebastian, you're next. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I had a quick question because I was watching this. Um, hey, please be quiet. I was watching this. Um, this uh, this lady was, and she was talking about when you're writing off your taxes, 
how um, you can you can get your your children as well, like uh, as your employees. Oh, how, yeah. how can you break that down? Mm -hmm. um, especially for the persons that are starting to do some things right. that like the online um, notary and sure. just preparing of or, or so on and so forth. Can you elaborate on that? No doubt. There, there is a huge deduction you can get. Let me let me flip flip off the screen. Um, I'll just put this up there for people while, who are looking while we're talking. Um, there's a huge deduction you can get pretty much all the way up to the standard deduction, which is now is a little over $12,000 for paying your kids to help you with your business, right? So I want you to think about this. This is money that you do, that you write off as, as, as wages to your children, right? So that's money that you can do. And it's also money that because they're, they're, they're minors and they don't make enough to, to, to pass the standard deduction, they don't need to pay taxes on either, right? So that is a huge thing is that if you have kids, you can definitely incorporate them into your business. Easiest way to do it these days, have your kid be one of your Instagram models, right? So-and-so Kardashian and Jenner gets paid billions of dollars to hop on Instagram. There is no, no reason why you can't tell the IRS, I pay my kid $12,000 a year because he's really cute. And so when I have him on, on my Instagram page that I'm advertising, I pay him to do so. Now, even the more creative thing as a parent is, and this is the rule, it's got to go from the business account to their account. So they got to have a business account, right? It's not like you can just slide them some money right off that you gave it to them and then that can be it. It has to go from your business account to that child's account so that the child will have to have an account. Obviously, you can be somebody like, a you know, you can be on the account as well, but it's got to have their name on it where the account goes. But then you can still kind of be their money manager, right? You don't need to tell your son, hey, I just got off this webinar. You can pay 12,000 bucks to look cute on Instagram, right? That doesn't necessarily need to be this type of conversation. You could be more creative as a parent and be like, hey, I already spend 12K on my kid. So when you want to go to the movies, don't ask me. You got the money, right? When you want to take so-and-so girl out, don't ask me. You got the money, right? And if you want your kid to pitch in for groceries, right? If, or if they want to play a sport and you want, and like that's money you would have already poured into your kid anyway, but everybody is saving money on tax support. So so I'm glad whoever you were watching, I, I couldn't remember, it, I couldn't, I missed, I think I missed who you said it, it was. It was a lady, um, uh, I gotta go back and get her name and I'll send it to you. Okay. But Okay, yeah. Always no, um, doing her little lives and trying to bring you, draw you into her business. Got you, know. you. Got you. Yeah, no, no. She's on it, man. Incorporating your kids into your business can save you a ridiculous amount of money. And if you have a that's like $12,000 a pop. Right? Each kid that you can pay them to be a part of your business and you or them don't need to pay taxes on it. Now, what you need to do is assign them a job that is worth the money that you're paying, right? That's why I chose Instagram because the IRS can never come back and say that whatever you're doing on Instagram ain't worth a couple thousand dollars because people are making billions of dollars on Instagram or on social media overall, right? So they can never come back and say that. But for instance, like the classic example is a real estate agent who has their kid run out and pull the sign up when they sell a home, right? And throw it in the back of the trunk. Is that worth 12K? Eh, not not necessarily, right? I mean, it, it depends, right? Uh, you know, you, they you might sell doing, a lot of houses. I mean, maybe, right? If they're <laughs> if they're on the run and they're working, they should they they could do the child wages, and they got a lot of mileage. They're running around, maybe, right? Little man, you got a job, brother. You better be ready. You better be ready, okay? Um, you know, so you could, you know, things like um. You know, maybe you maybe you run a storefront business and you have your kids uh, help greet clients when they come in, right? And you have your kids run and get them some water, ask them if they need anything right before you have a conversation with them or they step into your office. You you just need to know that twelve thousand dollars over twelve months, right? So that's a thousand dollars a month, a couple hundred bucks a week, right? You need to just find a role that they can play um, to to do so, and that's up to twelve thousand. After that, they will have to pay a little bit of taxes, right? So, so that, that's, that's usually the cap that's the most advantageous. It's all the way up to over the years, whatever the standard deduction is, right? That's the cap that you want to reach um, in, in terms of paying your kids. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, that, that's a level of, that's, a, that's like 201. That I wasn't even thinking we was going to get into, but I can already tell that you're thinking of more creative ways to save money on taxes. That, that's the level up that we need. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Ray. Yes, ma'am. Maisha wants to know. She hey, says, wait, wait. Thought... Sebastian was next. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sebastian. And I'm then sorry. Aisha. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so, Ray, going back on uh, going back on the 
the notarial acts and how much sure. uh, the tax deductions for each of those. Right. So something that I was told um, was that for, so for in a, in a loan signing package, each separate notarial act is on a different form. So each one is a completely separate act, which means that um, you can charge the full amount for each notarial act. And what you would do is charge the full amount until you eat up whatever the uh, whatever the total is that you have of, of your signing. So let's say you uh, are paid $150 for that signing, you would charge $6 for each notorial act until you meet that uh -huh. max. What goes beyond that, I'm not sure. And I am still new to the game. So if there's anybody else that can counter that or give you more information, great. But that's one thing that I've heard. Good. I appreciate you sharing that, Sebastian. That makes a lot of logical sense to me, right? Yeah. Like, you said you have something? I do. I do. It's seldom. Like, let's just say that you have that $150 and, and it's $6 per uh, notorial act. Um, there's seldom any more than 10, 15 notorial certificates in a package. So you're not really going to typically, typically, you're not going to exceed that $150. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. So, so each, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think, oh, and then, and Miss Diana added the difference is the travel convenience fee, right? So, so if you do six bucks per, per signature up to a certain amount, whatever's left could be that convenience fee. I think that makes a whole lot of sense that, like I said before, there's something I'm going to do my due diligence on and um, I can loop back with folks who are in this group um, to touch base well, on that. Um, well, not only, well, why don't you do, I'm going to let you finish your, 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 your well, presentation done. because, well, no, I'm just I'm interrupting anyway. Um, I think that it would be a good idea if you do part two for us. Came back. But we don't let you get, we're going to let you get through the 15 because we know you're busy with tax right. yeah, okay. No, but I'm, I'm more than happy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We want you to come. Do we want him to come back? Everybody raise your hands. We want him to come yeah. back. Don't yeah. forget about Maisha. No, they said they good. It's, it's okay. I ain't going to the person. It's all right. It's all right. Wait a minute. Hold Maisha. on. Don't skip over me, boo. Don't skip but, over me, boo. But is that Maisha <laughs> said don't skip over me, boo? Yeah, don't skip over me, I boo. Don't don't you. I can't forget you. <laughs> no, I'm, I was talking to him. Right, I ain't worried about it. What? Okay. You got a whole lot of yeses, so you got to come back. Okay. Go ahead, Maisha. No, that was okay. He did eloquently address my question about, and you did too, Miss Liz, um, and I really do appreciate the presentation, first of all, but just seeing if I could write off a portion of my um, t my household expenses, like the lights, the utilities, but I did not think about doing it per square footage. I have a four bedroom home, so I did it by bedroom. I don't even know if that would be right. Would that be an option, sir? Uh, well, I will tell you the, the same decision that you have, like we talked about with cars versus mileage and expenses, that's the exact same thing that you have with a home office deduction. You can choose to do $5 a square foot, or you can basically choose to do the percentage of your your costs for your home, right? So that, that's when okay. they brought up the, the, the utilities, uh, the internet, like Wi-Fi is definitely going to be huge. Um, you can do either one. Um, I think it would be easy if you're already doing bedroom, you could translate bedroom to square footage pretty easily because if you have an idea how much square foot the bedrooms is that you use <laughs> for your business, then you can just do that. And it's just five bucks for that. But it, it's for folks who, similar to, yeah, it's similar to mileage and expenses, you should choose which one is beneficial for you. So if you choose a big portion of your house, right, maybe you have a business, like, you know, folks like us, taxes and notary, at least in the present day, especially with technology, we may get away with having a smaller office, right? Where you kind of just need a computer, a printer, you kind of just need one room. But you can imagine if you had, you know, folks who have a whole warehouse as part of their house and you have a lot of product that you need to store somewhere, those folks should definitely do square footage, right? Because you have a lot of space that you need to, that you use for your business. So it's a decision that you can make. I think you could translate doing bedrooms to square footage pretty easily and it wouldn't be that hard to do on your return. Okay, thank you, Ray. Yes, ma'am, no problem. Ray, we have a question. Where are you located? I'm gonna let you answer. I mean, I, I did read your bio, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no, you good, you good. I live, I live in Wisconsin, um, and then I, obviously I, I teach, I teach in Dallas now. Um, I teach in Pleasant Grove, um, and so, 
kind of all I can get. PG, PG. There you go. We we out here, right? So so I I I can get anywhere in the Metroplex, and, and so I don't know if there's anybody who's on here who's not from Texas, right? If we if you if you need to have a conversation about what your state does. Um, that's different related to your personal taxes, then I can talk about that, right? Each state also taxes businesses differently, right? So if you have an LLC registered here, that's very different than if you have an LLC registered in Chicago, right? If you're in RGB, right, it's a very different conversation than, than, than what we're having in Texas. And so, um, you know, we, we can, we can if, if there are people who are from other states, I don't know everything, I haven't been everywhere, so I don't know everything about every other state, but I, I can at least help you find somebody who does know who's from there um, or get the answer for you. Thank you. Okay. This thing has been up there on the screen for a while, but if you if you know that you go to the same place and get a whole lot of signings, you can just ask them if they're going to give you a 1099. Right? It's your job as the business person to to keep track of how much money people pay you. But by law, by the IRS, they're supposed to give you a 1099 that says, "Hey, we paid this loan signing agent over the course of the entire year." three thousand dollars right and we know that that's how much we paid that will help you on your taxes a lot more because that's one less um like little line item that you need to keep track of but just you can you can have that conversation with your title companies or or anything like that um if you do have a relationship with them is that if somebody is paying you over 600 bucks to do a service um and you're not enrolled on or, and you're not on their payroll as a w-2 they they are technically supposed to give you a 1099 now do most people you know most businesses especially small businesses do this no because you actually have to pay in order to file 1099 1099 so so that's an expense that that's it's it's as your business is growing you may need to get somebody to do a 1099 miscellaneous right depending on how you pay your kids you may need to give them this right and if you don't do w2 you know you there are different ways you you can pay your kids, right? But it has to be official, right? This is one way to do so. But something to keep in mind is that be on the lookout for those 1099s. They usually they should come by the end of January, so that you can have them well before the tax deadline. Keep an eye out for those as it relates to your business. Right? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of this uh, the chat box. It's kind of blocking my view here. That's okay. Um, whoops. Uh, business taxes are com more complicated than personal taxes, right? So. And I'm not gonna ask nobody to raise their hand, but I'm sure there are folks in here who have last minute, pull up the TurboTax, pull up to the H&R Block, and then somehow they poof, you know, their taxes are done. Or especially in this last couple of years, if you've had to run up and get your tax return done so you can get that $1,200 stimulus check, plus $500 for any kids, right? That's not really gonna work now that you're a business owner, right? Just kind of running up and doing your taxes well, may, you might be able to get away with it for a little while, and I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to tell you what to do. I at least want to give you information so you know how to make the best decision for whatever you need to decide, right? But business taxes are more complicated, and what that translates into for you is also more expensive, right? So you need to decide how you're going to file, right? If you can educate yourself on how to do this, I definitely recommend you self prepare, right? Because if you know how to prepare your taxes as well as a tax professional is, one, you should be knocking out your taxes like it's nothing. Two, you should probably be starting a tax business because you already know more than 99% of Americans do, right? Even if you've stayed on, you know, however many people have stayed on for this hour and 20 minutes, you already know more than 99% of people do. Self-prepare is always an option. You're going to see ads about it. You're going to see everybody recommending do it. There is one thing I want to talk about is a free e-file program with the IRS, right? And I'm going to talk about these two things in a second, but I want you to at least know that there is a way if you make under a certain amount of uh, per year, I think for single folks, it's around $75,000. If you make under 75, you have the right to get your taxes filed for free. So, so it's, especially I'm talking to the folks who won't come to a tax professional, which I highly recommend you do. I haven't given my pitch yet. I highly recommend you get somebody to do it, especially if, you're, if, you, if your business is growing and you want to take it seriously. But especially if you're somebody who's, already, who's chucking out 100, 120 bucks to TurboTax to do your taxes and you don't make over 75, you could have used the free version and it's the exact same thing. All you need to do is Google IRS free e file. And HR Block has a service, TurboTax has a service, Tax Slayers, Sax Slayer Pro has a service. There are a bunch of different offerings that are officially registered with the IRS. You can either self prepare that you can pay for, or if you make under a certain amount, you can do free e file. Now, these two options are best for people who maybe are just getting started, who, who, who can't. Um, well, for them, you know, the, the, the cost of tax prep fees can, can kind of put a damper, you know, 
kind of cut their business down in a way that they're not really used to or comfortable with. Keeping in mind that if you're going to grow seriously, you need to hire a bookkeeper and you need to hire somebody to do your taxes. CEOs should not be sitting there figuring out how to file their taxes. That's not what that, that's not what CEOs should be doing. My right? other option is you can find somebody like me, right? Priority Finance or anybody in the Jumping Jack Tax community, you can download the Jumping Jack Tax app. We're getting a whole new flood. I just saw today in a group chat of about five new people who are getting trained who are part of this community. I highly recommend you look up Jumping Jack Tax here in the Metroplex who are coming here, who are, who are going to be able to offer services to the community. You can have somebody prepare for you, but especially for your business, especially if you're already past the LLC single member sole prop phase and you're in the S Corp partnership phase, you need to figure out how you're going to file. All right, because logging on to whatever ad pops up on Instagram, the H&R Block, TurboTax, whatever, may not cut it for you, right? And I, I will just give this pitch, right? I'm not even going to give a whole pitch because I'm not really here to, to, to try to, you know, I'm not in the business to have everybody do their, their taxes with me because I'm not out here to try to be the Walmart of the tax industry, right? But I will say this, everybody who doesn't choose to do their taxes with me goes to H&R Block or TurboTax. Everybody who chooses to do their taxes with me has come from H&R Block or TurboTax. What does that tell you? That tells you that these self-prepare and free e-files will work for a little while. And if you have a simple return, I do not recommend you pay somebody hundreds of dollars to do it, right? I will even walk you through how to do it on your own, right? If you have a very simple one, right? But especially if you're a business owner, and you, and when you, once you pop that Schedule C on there, it's a whole different level of scrutiny and analysis the IRS does to your return. You need to make sure it's done correctly. It is an investment that is worth it no differently than insurance on, on yourself, on your family, on your home. This is insurance for your business, right? There is nothing worse than an audit from the IRS, right? And now most audits are not the worst thing in the world. Usually they send you a notice and then you have to send something back and then they run it and then they tell you, hey, you actually need to do this, right? It's not necessarily, not everyone goes to prison over an audit, right? And I, don't, I don't want to over-dramatize it like some people might do. Not everybody gets fined thousands of dollars, but... I mean to say that you need to decide how you want to do this, right? And it can't be a, man, let me just, let me just go with the free e-file and let me just see if I can do it. That's like sending your loved one to, to the doctor and, and, and just kind of Googling what prescription. Go, it's like going on WebMD, Googling what prescription based on the symptoms that you have, rather than going to a, a medical facility, paying that copay, getting tested for whatever you might have, getting an official diagnosis, and knowing for sure, as close as you can, what you have, okay? These are oh, three- Ray, well, Ray, you know, you know, I went to the doctor last year, and they told me something, 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 and I said, well, what's that? She said, Google it. So I may as well go to WebMD and get a new doctor. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and that's what I was saying, is that I don't necessarily recommend you go from doctor whoever to WebMD, but I do recommend you do some shopping, right? You, you know, taxes is an industry where people, usually once you find somebody, you develop a certain level of loyalty, right? I kind of tell it to, to, to brothers. It's kind of like, and I don't know if there's a lot of brothers on here. It's kind of like going to a barber, right? You don't really switch barbers unless something, something happens, right? And you don't really, there might be times where you're sitting in the chair and, and the person who did your hair or whatever didn't necessarily snap like they did last time, but you don't really say nothing, right? So if your tax preparer didn't really have a conversation with you in depth about the home office deduction, he might be like, man, my uncle, they best friends with my uncle, man. Let me, he, he did it once. Let me just go back. All right, he'll get it right. Nick. You know what I'm saying? You, taxes is, 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 you are in control, right? You are the one paying somebody money to do your taxes. That means you should be the one deciding who gets to do it. No differently than your doctor, right? The power dynamic may feel a little bit different, but don't feel like, oh, because I've been with this person for years that you need to go with them. Or don't feel like because you just met me on some webinar that you need to do it with me. Like that, that, that's not why I'm here, right? I'm not here to, to, to necessarily get everybody, everybody on here to do their taxes with me. Now, obviously I would love for you to help take care of me and my family, especially my new wife, right? I would love for you to help me do that. And I would love for you to help me take care of your taxes for you. But I do mean to say more so on a mission standpoint is that you need to be making the best decision for you and if your tax person ain't it fire them they are on your payroll essentially you pay them you determine whether they get paid next year make the decision accordingly right if they have not had any conversations with you or if you know how to look at your return and you don't see any of the things that we've talked about on here and you've been a notary for a while clearly you either you and your your tax preparer don't know each other well or you're getting played Either one, you need to have a conversation with them. Either to say, hey, this is how we need to do it, 
or I'm sorry, I don't think I'm going to go take my business elsewhere. Some conversation needs to happen. So we don't want to do WebMD. I call TurboTax, H&R Block, the WebMD of taxes. People try to pretend like they're professionals. You would never pretend to be a medical doctor if you were, you were giving out a prescription to somebody who you love. Please don't pretend like you know how you do your taxes. Now, if you educate your game enough to know how to do it, go off, right? Please. Please, you know, especially if you're still under 75, man, do the free e-file, right? Get every little deduction that you're owed, and now that the IRS has this program, get paid for it. Also, keep in mind, the only reasons why these top two things exist is because the IRS knows people are going to make mistakes. I just got an email from the IRS the other day that there's $1.5 billion that's been unclaimed from tax refunds since 2016. Why are people not claiming their money? It's because they didn't know how to. You didn't know how to do your taxes. And the IRS is literally saying, look, after a certain amount of years, it becomes our money. We can send it to you if you're a little bit late, but pretty soon we're just going to take this billions of dollars that we're sitting out here. And it's primarily because people are being convinced by these online services that they're tax professionals. You don't need to feel like you need to know how to do your taxes. This is the TurboTax ad. Anybody can do taxes. If you don't do nothing and you have a basic return, sure. Yeah, the questions will walk you through exactly what you need to do. That's perfectly, that's what you need. But if you're a serious business owner and you're trying to do some creative things, and one, it takes a whole lot of time to do that, I promise you, paying somebody to file your taxes the right way will save you a lot of time, money, stress, energy, headache, years on your life by doing so. So. Question. Yes, ma'am. Let's say that someone did their taxes themselves. Mm -hmm last year for, let's say for the last four years right they've done their taxes themselves through self self-preparing right is it is it possible for that individual to have someone like you audit those taxes and see if money has been left on the table yeah. and the IRS would then give a refund up to a, a certain, I think it's like five years or something like that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah there's, there's definitely a year cap. We can only go back so far. The answer to your question is absolutely yes, right? There are folks, including myself, mm -hmm. who you can send your old tax returns to, and I will sit down with you and have a conversation with you and ask you some questions to say, hey, you had this on there. Did you know that you had this on there? Oh, uh, well, it, it just kind of, I just kind of clicked through and it said something about it and then a, a window popped up and I didn't really know what it meant. And, and so, yeah, yeah, I put it on there, but you know, okay, that's fine, right? Or you have somebody else do them, right? And then you didn't really, you just kind of gave them away your taxes and you just kind of let them run with it, right? We call it a second look. That's, that's what we call it in taxes. And some, some companies um, even charge a fee for you to, to, to look at a second look, right? Some people charge around $50 to, to look back at your return. They can't promise that they can find any money that was missed out, but that's kind of the, that's kind of the idea is that you, you, can, you can pay for the service to have somebody comb through and make sure that they're done correctly. And then they can submit um, uh, an amended return on your behalf so that you can get back the money that you should have gotten. Um, especially for folks on this, um, on this call, um, in addition to the $25 I'm gonna talk about later, I'll do that for you for free. I'll do that for you just because. All right, I, I, I don't, you know, some people charge for it. it. It's not really something that I, that's not a business revenue stream that I need, right? If you, if you are unsure or uneasy about your taxes and there's something I can do to restore your peace of mind about it, whether I can look at it and say, yes, you should keep your tax professional, this looks excellent, right? This looks like you did everything correctly. Nothing looks shady. Nothing looks like it could do a red flag. You look good. Now, you, you didn't miss this, this, and that perfectly fine. Even if you don't choose to do an amended return, what if you're like, man, I'm just going to cut my losses. They gave me my money. I don't want to, I don't want to have any more conversation with the IRS and I need to. That's fine too. But yes, 100% Miss Head, that, Miss Head, that's a whole market of people going back and doing things correctly because by the millions, more people are being convinced that they can WebMD their way to health, WebMD their way to tax health. And enough people get away with it for the industry to grow. But like I said, Every single person who chooses not to do their taxes with me ends up going to H and R Block or TurboTax, right? Or they have somebody who they who they've been with for a while, right? Family friend, perfectly fine, right? But every single person, not one, who has come, has come from anywhere else but one of these self prepare services, because they've been like some issue. I didn't get a refund last year, which is an iffy conversation, right? That doesn't necessarily mean you did anything wrong. Um, I got a notice in the mail. 
Um, why do I always owe? Uh, I, I started this new thing um, and I, I'm having an issue who's, who, which one of my, whether the mom or the dad is going to claim my kids. And so we had a little bit dispute about it and somebody else got to claim my kids when I thought I was going to. Taxes can be complicated and that's not something you should be sitting at on, on, your, phone, on your phone or at home looking up how to Google what your diagnosis is. Here's pretty much a summary, right? You should decide how your business needs to be structured, right? Not how your business necessarily how your business is structured. If you have no idea, the answer is the first one: A, sole prop. That's what you are. If you've done nothing and you've just started doing notary, that's what you are, right? But you need to decide how you should be structured. I have an LLC. I'm sure you'll meet a lot of people who recommend having an LLC. It gives you a great combination of of tax benefits of of, of protection. Um, obviously, you know, you can think of an LLC as something that already safeguards against the E&O and, and, and bond um, insurance that you already need to be a notary. The LLC can add some liability protections should anything happen to you. Um, S Corp and C Corp is, is kind of like a kind of like next level um, discussions that business owners can have. Once you once your business has been cruising for a while and you make consistent money, um, you should have a conversation with somebody about whether an S Corp or a C Corp might be beneficial for you. Most likely S Corp. C Corp is if you want a bunch of other people to be able to pour money into your business and own the business alongside of you. That's a lot of stocks or C Corps. But S Corp is a cool different way that small businesses can operate where they don't need to, you know, like we already talked about how notaries don't need to pay that FICA tax on that a little bit that they make. S Corps don't have to pay FICA taxes on a whole lot that they make. There are rules, right? You need to figure out how you should be structured to take advantage of it. Second is, is find a bookkeeping system, whether it's getting a bookkeeper, whether it's, it's, it's you know, spending this quarantine, learning everything there is about QuickBooks, taking an online course or something like that. You need to have that down because there's a lot that I have to let people know. I can't put that on your tax return. I mean, I, I literally can't have you do that because there's, we don't have anything to back that up. And I, I wouldn't want to put you or me at risk for doing so. Okay. If you don't have a separate bank account, I highly, highly, highly recommend you talk to your bank about what offerings that they have. Um, and then four, decide how you're going to file. And for folks who, who are really on the edge, decide how you're going to file within the next two weeks. Because you got July 15th is the deadline for filing last year's taxes, 2019. Right? July 15th is also, as a reminder, the deadline for making those estimated quarterly payments um, to the IRS. Right? But you need to decide who is going to file, prepare, and who's going to pay your taxes. For me, and when I'm a bookkeeper, when I put my bookkeeper hat on, I do that for my clients. So, so you, wouldn't, you wouldn't even have to worry about it. But these are the must-dos for notaries. It's not just for notaries. This is for businesses overall. But don't forget about those FICA taxes. If you need to tell your tax professional or remind them, if they don't already know, that notaries are exempt from that. Um, and then just don't, don't forget this moment, right? This first paycheck. You get it, right? Your first signing is hype. Your boys is dapping you up. Your girls is snapping at you, right? You're going off and then you get hit with taxes. Do not look like this in two weeks. There are a lot of things that you could do that we spent a whole lot of time talking about that can prevent this feeling of, wait, what? What are, what are all these? Why, why do I owe $3,000 this year? I've never owed before. You're a business owner now. Welcome. Okay. That's all I got. That's all I got. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This was excellent. You know, we went over 34 minutes and I did not even cut you off. So that means it was really good. <laughs> so well, thank I, appreciate, I appreciate you playing nice. You didn't, you didn't need to play that nice with me. Yeah, you, you, you should have cut me off. <laughs> it was, I, I was like, you. okay, I'm going to wait until he's not talking about something that's really yeah, important. It, it never happened. happened. Yeah, it never happened. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, you said... There's a $25. You had something on the screen about $25. No, no. If, if you, if you, if you on here or if you're watching and you hit me up, I'm going to know. Or I'll, I'll ask him and say, yo, is this person legit? Okay. I got you. That's what I'm saying. I got you. All right. You, you don't ask, don't ask me. You need to ask Tamika. Yeah. I'll ask Tamika. Well, actually, yeah. I'm going to, I'll send you a list. So you don't have to ask anyone. Oh, definitely. So yeah. you'll get a yeah, list. No. Of all, you'll get a list of all, a list of all the attendees. So um, again, I I thank you. I will be in touch for this part two of um, this presentation. You're gonna do some research on some things that uh, we had questions on, and we're, we're gonna have you back. Um, 
it, this is Excellent. great. Again, Excellent. these Wednesday night spotlights, we spotlight all small businesses. So if anyone on here has a small business and they want to uh, do a spotlight, please contact me. I'll put my information in the chat. Uh, this is what it's about. We want to help each other with our businesses. We want to help each other grow. And that's how we do it by sharing platforms like this. Um, Liz, did you have anything no. to add? Yeah, just that anyone who wants to, you know, we're more than happy, you know, we're more than happy to, to allow you to come on and, and, um, it's a little, you know, it's free advertising for you. We just ask that you give, um, like a 25 gift, $25 gift card um, to someone for, and it could be like $25 gift card to your particular business. And it's just giving back to the community. You know, we are all small businesses and we want to support each other. So that's one way that we can support each other with just a little small token of $25. And you, you give it to, Tamika usually does a raffle or something to determine who gets that uh, that that uh, that twenty five dollar gift card or twenty five dollars off or whatever the case may be, but it would be to a small business. And then, of course, with that being said, <clears throat> Tamika is going to tell you because she's got the list. She's going to tell you uh, what other presentations we have coming up. Uh, for the month of July, in addition to the classes that we have uh, coming up for the month of July. Like Ray, I want everybody to be in my classes. However, my classes, my, my training style, Tamika's training style is not for everybody. But if you're going to do this notary business so that you will have to call Ray, to do your taxes for you, you need training. So you get the training from somewhere and just make sure that it's not the web MD type training as Ray has put it. Right. So just make sure it's some solid training. But before you get out there and, and decide you're going to go do some long signings because somebody told you it was easy, mm -hmm. do your research. Do your research to figure out if this is really the thing for you. Take it away, Mika. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we're going to take a break on this weekend because it's the 4th of July. I know most of us are still not doing anything, but I refuse to put a class on the schedule for this Saturday. And I will let you know your trainer was not happy about that, but we are taking a break for the 4th of July. And we will pick back up July 11th with Notary One-on-One, -on -one, and then Workshop One follows that very next Saturday, and then Workshop Two the Saturday after that. So if you have not registered for um, our classes, please do so. If you want to come back for a refresher, please contact us. We can do that as well. We're we're in COVID right now, so it's Zoom. We're not paying. Come on on. Uh, we're not paying a room fee. So if you need a refresher, let us know. We'll we'll send you a link. Uh, the Wednesday spotlights, the next one is July 8th, which is Joyce Brown, and she's going to be talking about credit and how we need to protect our credit and how it is power and how just small little things can push your credit up, your, you know, so that's very important. And so she, she's actually coming back for a part two because she also did a presentation and we had so many questions. We're like, you got to come back. So she will be back July 8th. Um, after that, it'll be July 15th, which is uh, Regina Kennedy, and she'll be talking about her do's and don'ts that she learned in the first year of being a loan signing agent. So that's going to be some good information. Uh, July 22nd, we have our very own Liz with live question and answers, and she's also going to be talking about uh, how to... Uh, convert those travel fees. We were talking about a little bit about that with how we're doing our taxes. So she has a whole presentation about travel fees. So that will be July 22nd. And then also after that, she does live questions and answers. So um, you may want to uh, join in for that if you have any questions because we're live and in, in person. The refresher, if you uh, do choose to do a refresher with us, it's a, a, it's a discounted rate of $100. So uh, Please, if you need a refresher, if, you, if you've if you done the class and you didn't go out there, like she says, you got to take the class and 
do it scared. If that wasn't you and you need to come back, let us know. Uh, let's see. And then July 29th, it's going to be uh, Christy from Mansfield Funeral Home. Something we do not like to talk about, but that's part of planning. So she's going to talk about the planning of, you know, our demise. So you don't want to leave your family with a bill. You know, they're already upset unless they didn't like you. They already upset about you, <laughs> about you gone. So you don't want to leave them with a bill. <laughs> so that's all I have. Um, does anyone have any questions for me? I did put the, uh, my email, which is info pretty and branding.com. If you want to do a, a spotlight on Wednesday, the more the merrier. We are full for July. I have a few spots in August. So um, if that's something you want to do, we welcome you to it. Uh, let's see. Tamika, could you send me the information on the refresher? Note? Okay, I will do that. Uh, let me copy that before we go. And uh, this, this actual uh, presentation will be on our YouTube channel, as well as um, I'll, I'll share it on the Facebook training uh, workshop that we have. So if you are not a member of our workshop group, please send us a request so we can get you in there. So I think that uh, slides. Every, well, um, Mr. Ray, are you going to share your slides? I guess the presentation, they just want the slides. Will you share the slides? Be more than happy to. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Tamika, yes. can you hear me? Yes. I have a question. I happen to come across this. I don't know how. I think somewhere on Facebook on this particular uh, class or training. This is the first time I attend. How can I? Uh, what is? Is there a link? Um, is there a Facebook page that I can okay. continue? Hold on. Thank you. I'm going to put that up there for you. Okay, I just shared the link for the uh, Facebook group, and that's how you'll you'll know everything that's going on with EC Head Consulting. Um, let me see if I can share the YouTube link real fast. And here is the YouTube. So there you go, you have it all. Uh, uh, Tanika, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you see, um, I don't know if you see the, uh, in the chat, um, Shasta wants to know if you will email this information to her. But I think we've just established that, right, you're going, because you'll get a list of all the people who are on on here tonight. So you're going to email your presentation to them. Is that correct? Yeah, ma'am. And I sent, I sent her a private message. I don't, I don't know where you are, Ms. Shasta, where you can see it. I told her I'd send her, I'd send her the presentation and I'd also send her um, some of the information about our the, the group the classes, all of those things too, so she can look at it. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. You're so awesome. I knew I liked you. Ashley, you're not on the group? Well, how'd that happen? No, I thought you said it was another, uh, I'm thinking it was a new group uh, oh, that you were saying. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, was, I think you're already <laughs> on there. Okay. <laughs> all right, so oh, sorry, if... Go ahead. I just want to get one more thing. Um, I had, I've had a few folks hit me about uh, taking care of their taxes, which I really do appreciate. 
Um, but another thing I want to plug again is that taxes and notary go hand in hand. If you're driving around and you see a tax office, 99% of the time they also offer notary. So if this is something that you're interested in, send me an email. We can sit down and talk about how you can start your own business. I can show you the, the program that I went through. Um, it takes roughly about a year or so to get officially, officially up and running from where you are now to then. Um, taxes is a wonderful industry that you can make a whole lot of money in a few months of the year and you don't need a college degree per se to do it, right? You need some sort of training to do it well, similar to notary and loan signing. But um, let me know if this is something that you want to get into for your business, right? You want to add taxes to your practice. Sorry, that was it. We can all go to bed now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, Ray, this was excellent. I will be contacting you uh, for part two. So uh, thank everyone and good night. All right, y'all. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. And Ms. Samika, do you know if, um, how do I, let's see here. Can you download all of the chat, like all of the text from the chat from a thing, or does it kind of just disappear? Uh, see, that's new territory for me. Okay, let me see if I can just copy and paste. You might want to just copy and paste it real fast before I end the yeah. meeting. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Um, I just don't want to put people's names, and some people put email addresses in here. I don't want to lose track of so. Yeah, go ahead and do it. Just tell me when you're uh, when you're done. Okay. Okay. Come on. Come on. Okay. Okay. I got it. Got it. All right. Thank you. Right. Have a good Have night. Have a good evening.